he wanted you to know, uh, to get to know about Atlanta and so forth. So if the governor was here today, he would say, welcome to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the state has been voted four years in a row, the number one state to do business, and uh, continuously growing. And look, in, uh, in, in, in a, one of the best institutions here in the country. So we're, we're glad to have you here today. So what I'd like to do today, <coughs> give you an idea, talk a little bit, but how we do economic development here in the state of Georgia. And then uh, one of my collaborators here, who has the exciting presentation, uh, will tell you how we implement what we talk about. So, <coughs> who we are. We are the sales and marketing arm of the state. We go out and promote and talk about all the good assets that we have here in Georgia. Uh, and how, what we do, this is our marketing definition, but in all reality what we do is make sure we don't, this, the government doesn't raise the taxes. Our mission is to broaden the tax base for the state of Georgia. What we don't do, we don't influence legislation, we don't give money, we don't mandate and we don't regulate. We do this. We have 11, actually now, international offices to help us with this effort, to recruit new companies here in Georgia from around the world and also promote products made in Georgia. The Centers of Innovation were created about 10 years ago. Do I need to speak to this? Uh, the Centers of Innovation were created about 10 years ago. <coughs> And it was a time that uh, I said, okay, I'm, uh, I fulfilled my mission here, I'm leaving. And I said, but what you really need to do? He said, we have so many assets here in the private industry, within the universities, and also the government, that they want to help with the, uh, with the industry, to, with economic development. We have thousands of companies here that would love to have access to these assets. And they said, can you write one page? So I wrote half a page. And then they said, well, this is your new job. So we created what we call the Centers of Innovation. It was a, an economic development program, unique, nobody had a similar one, that connects the private industry with the universities for the purpose of innovation, innovation-based economic development. Our, and we're somewhere here in this area. We work with, with new ideas and we help them fail fast or commercialize fast. And since we couldn't be everything to everybody, actually see us as the link between the industry, the private sector, the government, and the universities. Since we couldn't do everything to be everything to everybody, we focused on our strategic industries. How we select our strategic industries was what, what do we have a lot of, and what has the potential of growth and pay high salaries. So we started with logistics. We have the the fourth largest port in the country and the, and the busiest or not busiest, the most traveled airport in the country, in the world. So, and, and with the highways and the interstates and, 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 and the railroads, we were a, a natural logistics uh, state. Uh, the next one was aerospace. We have about 200,000 people working in the aerospace industry. We were an agricultural state, so agricultural technologies, manufacturing and so forth and so forth. And we spread them around the state based on the, where the concentration of industries are. <coughs> so <coughs> energy was the last one that we created. So my job was to go and create these. The last one was the energy. And I said, the energy industry is very important, but are we an energy state? So I said, Let it, let's look. So here's the state of Georgia. So what do we do? We spend about $4 billion to buy natural gas from Texas. We spend $1.2 billion to buy coal from Wyoming. And then we spend another $22 billion to buy transportation fuel from Texas. So we send to Texas $26 billion every year. So then I compare this to our state budget. Our state budget now is $23.7 billion. So it takes $23, $24 billion to run the entire state, but $27 billion goes out of the state 
and we send more money to Texas than it is our budget. So when I did this seven years ago, the study, this column here was at $36 billion, and this column here was at $18 billion. So it was twice as much. So we're kind of shrinking this and growing this slowly and steadily. So it makes, we said, yes, we are an energy state. We're an energy consumption state. So what are we going to do about it? <coughs> so we said, okay, let's focus from the beginning what Mother Nature does. So I drew this sun here in the middle. And I said, what does the sun do? Generates energy, then transmits it to the earth, distributes around the earth, and the earth stirs, uh, stores it, and then we consume it. So these are the four areas of the energy ecosystem. And then we looked at the government level where we are. What are our strengths? These are the strengths that we have. And then how can we build, build, this, uh, build businesses or recruit businesses or grow industries around those four areas of, er of uh, the four areas of the energy ecosystem, which is the energy, st energy generation, uh, transmission, distribution, and storage. With well, the main objective is to localize our energy model and reduce that, that expenditure and have a positive economic impact to our state. <clears throat> so since then, we focus on our, let me go back, we, I focus on our strategic, or what I call it, our un unfair advantage. What is that? We have a lot of sun. So the solar industry was a prime industry to grow. We have a lot of trees, biomass, and we have a lot of waste, which is agricultural waste, industrial waste, and consumer waste. These are three uh, areas where we can generate our own, our, 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 our own energy. But generating is one thing. How do we pull this renewable energy? So and here is what we did. So we went and we started recruiting companies. We don't do things because it's good. The government doesn't do this. And the businesses don't do this. And the, pr and, and the utilities don't do it something because it's good for the people, it's good for the air. They look at the bottom line because they have investors, they have employees to employ them and pay them. So we went and we recruited companies in the solar energy ecosystem, solar cell makers, solar panel makers, solar inverter makers, uh, and, and then the latest one, solar energy storage. So in that process of seven years, we went from we don't have any sun, and what happens when the sun shines but we have clouds and it rains, and so forth, and solar energy is not reliable, so therefore will never work. By the way, the people in the, folk, in, the tel in the telecom industry in the early 90s used to say the same thing about wireless. This is not going to work, because it rains, we have tall trees, the signal gets interrupted, will never work. The money is in the long distance landlines. <coughs> so <coughs> these, these companies don't exist anymore. So we don't want to fall in the same trap. So we went in, we recruited them, in the past seven years, we went from the bottom two to the bottom ten, to the top seven. Actually, we're number seven in uh, solar installation. We have 1.4 gigawatts of solar. But we had to pull it, right, to help this grow because the, 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 the utilities, they said, we're going to charge you an extra $5 to buy a block of solar energy. So you remember? Why most of the people bought iPhones, the stand of Andro Androids, 10 years ago? Because there was an app for it. So we had to create the apps that will pull this renewable energy, or not create, help uh, promote the apps. And that's the electric vehicles. So we got very heavy in electric vehicle infrastructure. Many people bought them. We were number two. Now we're number four. <laughs> we have more than 25,000 electric vehicles. And these people paid for the extra money to buy uh, solar energy. So this, this is where we are now. And, and we have $2 billion investment and so forth, and these are the results. We're measured with what, uh, for what we do. Another thing that we did after we finished with that, and we're still working on a waste to energy projects and some other things right now. But we look a little bit farther down the road and I said, what are the main issues humanity will face from here until the end of time? So, so what is this? food, water, waste remediation, and energy ties this all together. So we went out and started talking about this. We're, we're, we're in the process of localizing our energy model. It's working slowly. Now we have to localize the food model. 
and how do we do that? Why and why do we need to do that? Most important, because when I talk to universities and high schools, and I said, I want you to remember three numbers: two, seven point one billion, ten billion people, ten billion. So we started with two of something that became seven point one billion people. In twenty-five years from now, we're going to have ten billion people. In the meantime, we haven't created more land, water, or air. How do we feed all these people? We have to use technology. <coughs> Here comes control environment agriculture. So we went out and started finding companies, technologists, who is out there, that they, we can take greenhouses, we can upgrade them, and make them low level clean rooms, and control the environment, and therefore grow anything we want to grow. Because with LED lights now, we can do it. So we start creating these projects. We recruited people from Ohio and Netherlands and so forth and so forth to create this. We have our first investment that happened two weeks ago, $110 million. And the objective is afterwards to use renewable energies from waste energy or solar energy. So local energy, local food production. So that it doesn't have to travel. And we're talking about leafy greens, and so forth. Why we're doing this? We, because we want to make, with, through control environment agriculture, we want to make agriculture repeatable, predictable, and sustainable. Something that's not today. Not to mention all the other good things that come along with it. These are four. You can come up with another 50. But in order to do all these things, we have to create partnerships. We're not, each one of us, we're good, but no, we're not that good. So we have to go out and find people that are better than us and create those partnerships. It's the public, private, philanthropic partnerships. And this is one of the partnerships that we have here. And you'll see what's in done. <clears throat> so what we did is, Ali called me three years ago and she said, hey, I have this idea. You know, we want to do this sustainability thing. This is our mission with the, uh, with uh, uh, our foundation, you know, all about sustainability, energy, safety, and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, so we sat there, we had meetings, we brought other people together, we brought in the Georgia Department of Transportation and so forth, and I said, how about if we use state assets to test and demonstrate new technologies and prove the new business models and safety, for example, visitor centers when you come into the own by the Department of Transportation managed by us. So how can we do that? <coughs> so we created this partnership. So Ali here went and brought everybody else into the mix in the private industry. People we couldn't we, we didn't have we couldn't reach. And now the partnership grew. And now we're having more coming into the partnership. So what we've done in the meantime, I know I don't know if we have seen this <coughs> But these are solar panels. This is a French company. If you want to see the website, it's What Way by Colas. And, and here it is. You can have a look at this, how it is, and then how over here this is actually the actual roadway. Right? <coughs> so this is installed in one of the visitor centers and generates electricity when there are no, there's no traffic. The roads are sitting there, right? Why should they sit there? Let's put them to use. Number two, the Ray Foundation Alley, when I brought this company from the UK, you drive your car over it, and it tells you your tire pressure and the trend of your tires. Road safety. Also, we built the solar tree with the solar chargers, fast chargers over there, so people can stop when they take a break they can charge the electric vehicle. So, these are the things our department does. And that's why, and we work with the partnerships, and that's why for four years in a row now, we've been voted the state of Georgia as the number one state to do business, and our department has been voted the number, the number one state economic development agency in the country. This is the second time they did this, and we won both of them. So, now the exciting part. This is, uh, uh, this is the Georgia promotion stuff. 
to do this, we have, an idea, we have the desire, we have the vision, we bring the people together, but then we have to have doers, that they go out and do things and implement what we want to do. And Ali here will uh, show you some of the exciting things that we're doing. Hey, good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Um, I understand that most of you are not from the South, is that right? Northeast, other parts of the country? That's really cool. I'm so happy that we're hosting you here in Atlanta. And um, I'm going to tell you about the Ray, not because I want you to be impressed with Georgia, but because I want to get you interested in roads and transportation. And I want to show you some really cool stuff that we've done with Costas and others here in Georgia, and I hope you'll steal it. I hope you'll take these ideas and you'll run with them in your own corner of the world. Um, because honestly, these technologies are ready to go um, and they need to scale. They need to scale quickly because these are some solutions that will help us with some really big problems. Um, we've got climate weirding. You know, we've had four hurricane landfalls in the United States this season. And last week, we had a hurricane, Nate, that was making a landfall. We had snow in Denver, and we had fire in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we had Montana in the worst drought of its history. And all of that was happening last week at the same time. It's pretty intense climate weirding. Um, I'm not trying to make a political statement, I'm just saying we burn fossil fuels. and. Um, and we put a lot of CO2 in the air. And we gotta figure out how to use technology to um, reverse some of the um, impacts that we're feeling the negative effects of. And the great thing that we focus on at the Ray is not telling scary stories. We tell stories about economic opportunity and social opportunity. And in the doing of new economic activities, um, and coming together um, as a society in the United States and as a global society, um, we can actually create more economic value and um, achieve broader goals through innovation. So we can solve some of the scary problems just by doing what we do best, which is innovating and making value for our communities and for our economy. So that's, um, that's the bottom line of the Ray. And I'll tell you, who is Ray and how we got to that approach. Does anyone in the room know about Interface Carpet Company? Is that familiar to anyone? Well, you're standing on it. <laughs> um, you, what do you notice about the carpet? Let's start there. Who, who can tell me what's different about this carpet than carpet most squares. carpet? That's right, they're squares. Um, Ray Anderson was the first to introduce carpet tiles to the United States back in the 70s. He found them in Europe on a business trip. He came back, he left his company. He took about 20 or 30,000 of his own money that he had set aside for his two daughters' college fund. How frightening is that? He took his kids' college fund and he started a company called Interface. This is in the mid 70s. And um, Ray was actually a Georgia Tech graduate. So it's a fitting conversation to have in this room. Um, Ray's timing was impeccable. He was the first to enter the market right before the 1980s when office spaces went into high rises and the cubicles became uh, widespread. And when you have cubicles and modular office space, your wiring has to move to the floor, right? Because you're constantly reconfiguring and changing. Um, the layout of your office. And so you can't have wiring in the ceiling, right? Coming down to cubicles. You have to have wiring in the floor. But wow, that's challenging, right? If you have wiring in the floor and you have a room full of carpet, then you gotta take up the entire room of carpet every time you wanna change the configuration of your cubicles. That won't work. But carpet tiles, you can just take up a couple of tiles, move your wiring around, and then you're back in business again. So Ray's initial investment of somewhere around 20 or 30,000 grew a billion dollar company. Um, Interface is now in 109, com uh, 109 countries worldwide. Um, they are the leader in modular flooring and um, um, they're valued at over a billion. So that's an American success story um, and it started here in Georgia. 
Um, Ray was from a city called West Point on the Georgia-Alabama border, and he started his company Interface in LaGrange, which was just 18 miles up Interstate 85 from West Point. Something happened to Ray. In the mid-90s, 1994, he was in California on a business trip and some impertinent individual stuck his finger in Ray's chest and said, what is your company doing for the environment? And Ray was a super competitive Georgia Tech trained engineer and businessman who re immediately retorted back, my company complies by all state and federal regulations, that's what I'm doing for the environment. And the young man on the West Coast who had his finger in the middle of Ray's chest said, oh man, you don't get it. And that started Ray on this uh, thought process of what don't I get? You know, what do they want from me and my company? We're in compliance. So Ray started reading and he continued to hear this call from his own company for an environmental plan, a sustainability plan. And in the mid-90s, sustainability was not a word yet. I mean, Ray was a fish out of water. Um, I will fast forward the story, because I want to get to the technologies, but Ray became the first industrialist in the world to use his own company to uh, understand how sustainability can be a value and a profit center and a driver of brand loyalty within his own company. It had never been tried before. There was no green initiatives in the corporate world. There were no green initiatives in uh, heavy industry in the early 90s. And Ray said, well, I've got a billion dollar company, let's try it. Um, Ray set a mission in 1994, just to think about this now, where we are in 2017. In 1994, this was Ray's mission for Interface. He said in 1994 that by 2020, his company would go zero petroleum, <coughs> zero carbon emissions, 100% wastewater uh, return and wastewater reuse, and zero waste to landfill. And for a carpet company, that's huge because you probably don't know, um, I didn't know until I started this work, but carpet is made from petroleum. The nylon is petroleum based, the backing is petroleum based, and all of that carpet was going to the landfill, and carpet in the landfill can persist over 300 years without breaking down. So Ray figured out how to shave the fibers off of the old carpet and spin it into new carpet. And it took him a little bit longer, but then he figured out how to break down the backing of old carpet and make new backing. Um, they have gone almost 100% off-grid with their uh, energy operations worldwide. And the company announced last year, this is really cool, so listen up. The company announced last year that they're gonna meet Ray's mission by 2020. That's pretty cool. To set a mission in 1994 and have it to be actually reached before its deadline. But then they announced their next mission. And Interface has pledged to make carpet from CO2 gas that they pull down from the atmosphere. They're gonna make carbon concrete. And actually this week their CEO said, our problem, meaning the US problem, is that we see CO2 as a waste, but at Interface, that's our raw material. That's our resource and we're gonna learn how to make carbon carpet. Um, Ray passed away in 2011. And in 2014, the state of Georgia, the legislature, we have the state legislature and the governor, did something that is um, special to the family, but pretty common in the state of Georgia, and I suspect it's common across the country. Um, they named a highway, sh a highway corridor after Ray. We name intersections and interchanges and highways and interstate links after people like they're going out of style. I mean, we got the Gladys Knight Highway here on North Avenue or Spring Street. We got Alan Jackson right by Ray's Highway. And something that overlaps with Ray's Highway is the Pearl Harbor Memorial Highway. So this is something that we do a lot in Georgia. We enjoy naming highways. Um, what's different about this highway? Well, when Ray passed away in 2011, he left his entire estate to a foundation. 
And that family foundation, when the designation of the highway was made a couple years later in 2014, the foundation, and in particular, Ray's youngest daughter, Harriet, said over a glass of wine on her back porch in LaGrange, said, you know what, I think I just made a big mistake because now my daddy's name is on a dirty highway and when he was alive, he was the greenest industrialist of the century. We can't put Ray's name on a highway. Well, the sign was already there, so we only had one choice, and that was to make the highway sustainable. And we had no idea what we were doing. Um, just to be honest and completely transparent, we were gonna plant wildflowers for monarchs. <laughs> Great thing to do. Um, not really fully leveraging um, the opportunities, but it's a great thing to do. And we were gonna put a solar panel in the median of the highway because we have 11 million Georgians and people from out of state who travel um, this memorial corridor every year. So we've got 11 million people to capture their imagination and show them a solar panel, right? That was our big idea. Um, the highway is 18 miles. Let's see if the pointer works. It doesn't, no it does, but not there, okay. So 18 miles starts at the state line of Georgia and Alabama um, near West Point. There's a visitor center that Costas mentioned right there at the state line. And it extends all the way to exit 18, which is the city of LaGrange, um, where Ray was, was uh, started interface. I'll quickly tell you what happens on this 18 mile corridor. There's a lot of logistics and manufacturing and it's globally important logistics and manufacturing. Um, Kia's only North American manufacturing, their only car plant in America is located on the Ray. Caterpillar has seven global divisions. One of them is headquartered on the Ray. Um, Interface has two manufacturing facilities and some corporate offices on the Ray. Walmart and Coca-Cola have major distribution on the Ray. Kimberly Clark has manufacturing and distribution on the Ray. Johnson Controls has manufacturing and distribution on the Ray. Um, and Century Tire out of China is building R&D manufacturing and distribution on the Ray. And now Amazon is looking at Georgia and specifically one of the sites that's in the running is the Ray to host the second headquarters for Amazon. So this is a lot of manufacturing and logistics that are happening on the Ray. So we took this 18 mile corridor and we went crying to Georgia Tech because <laughs> we had no idea other than wildflowers and a single solar panel what we were gonna do. I brought a couple of copies of this. I hope I don't leave with them. Um, Georgia Tech's been a year um, with the private sector. Um, a company called Perkins and Will helped a couple of um, uh, faculty members at Georgia Tech um, and a couple of classes, master's classes, to come up with a baseline of what are the opportunities in transportation. We started out wanting to make a sustainable highway, and at the time in 2014 when we Googled sustainable highway, nothing came up, which was shocking. We thought somebody in California, somebody had figured out how to make a sustainable highway. There was nothing. What we got were just pinpoints of specific technologies around the world. There was a lot of cool stuff happening in the Netherlands, something going on in Peru. You know, Michigan was doing a lot of smart car stuff. Um, so we asked Georgia Tech to come up with a plan for making the Ray sustainable. And then a mm, few months into the process, we said, actually make it restorative. Right? So don't just mitigate the negative impacts of transportation on the environment, on communities, but let's actually make the Ray create resources. Let's make the Ray restorative. So it should create revenue, it should create new water supplies that are clean, it should create clean air, it should restore the environment, and it should add value to the economy. And we pretty much copied Ray's mission and interface. Um, we, of course, what's the point of being environmentally sustainable if you're still losing human life on the highway, right? I mean, you can hug trees all day long, but if people are dying, that's a problem. 
costs. We wanted to go zero waste, and specifically, we wanted to make transportation an asset. Right now, transportation is in the liability column of society's balance sheet. We don't really consider transportation to be an asset, and we're not super excited about spending money on transportation infrastructure. It's a drag, and we don't do it. We don't do it often enough, and we don't take a lot of joy in making good transportation infrastructure. So we wanted to figure out, how do you turn transportation into an asset? So I'm gonna quickly cover a couple of things that Costas has already mentioned. But I'm gonna do it in a little bit more detail. Um, we did install, for the very first um, technology demonstration on the Ray, um, we installed a DC fast charger, which is currently um, there's emerging technology that's faster, but currently this is our fastest EV charging um, uh, piece of equipment. It charges about 80 to 90 percent of your EV battery in 20 minutes or less. Um, we incorporated this EV charging station at a DOT facility. This was pretty early on in our relationship with DOT. This was fall of 2015. And DOT wasn't really sure what we were talking about at the Ray. You know, they're trying to like pave more miles and we want to be sustainable. So they weren't really sure how we were going to work together, but they went out on a limb and, um, and agreed to allow this EV charging station to be installed at their visitor center. This visitor center has three quarters of a million visits every year on the Ray. So this is directly on the Ray. And we powered it with 12 solar panels, and that is what makes this system unique. Um, it is also grid tied because we wanted to ensure operation overnight. Solar power is not generated at night, right? Because the sun goes away. Um, there are integrated systems uh, that supply solar powered EV charging that have battery storage that can be. Um, untied from the grid and those are pretty cool and we'll work to get something like that on the Ray soon but this is what we started with in 2015 and you're probably saying to yourself you know Allie an EV charging station is not really technology right I mean you're underwhelmed right now right lift your hand if you're underwhelmed yeah I know I know but let me tell you what is overwhelming about this you could not come into Georgia on an interstate unless you were driving a Tesla if you wanted to come in by EV. You could not take your LEAF into Georgia on this interstate. You could not take your EV Soul, your Kia EV Soul, on this interstate and come into Georgia because we don't have charging infrastructure. You would run out of battery if you tried to drive your EV into Georgia unless you were driving a Tesla. And so we did one charging station and we opened up an entire interstate to EV travel into the state of Georgia. And we went one step further and we supplied the power, not from grid power during the day, but from solar energy during the day. So it's a perfect marriage of clean power from clean renewable power from the sun, supporting EV charging for the cleanest travel and the lowest carbon travel technology that we have at our fingertips. Um, our system since fall of 15 has generated nine megawatt hours of solar power and has avoided nearly seven tons of CO2. This is the first in the Southeast and there will be more. I'll just say one more thing about this and I don't wanna go into a lot of detail, but Autonomous vehicles are tested, and there's federal legislation that will broaden the ability of Google and other autonomous vehicle automakers to test AVs across the country. AV is, is, the, is the acronym for autonomous vehicle. All AVs will be EVs. Why? because an autonomous vehicle is supporting light radar, LIDAR, supporting 10 or more cameras, supporting onboard computing to take the information from the LIDAR, from the cameras, from other sensors around the car, dozens of sensors, and using the maps that it downloaded from the cloud. And it's making real-time decisions 
every moment of driving. The battery in your fossil fuel vehicle will not support that computing. You need a big battery to support LiDAR, cameras, sensors, and computing. All EVs, all AVs will be EVs. And the people who have not bought an EV because it's not time for them to purchase a new car, or they think that EVs are inconvenient, or you know, when it rains, can I still charge my EV, or will I get electrocuted? Like, there's a whole range of questions and concerns around EVs. But when AVs hit the market, most people believe that the adoption of AVs is gonna look like a hockey stick, right? It's gonna start out trickle, because they might enter the market being pretty expensive, and then it's gonna go fast. Why? Because AVs offer convenience, right? You can, you can tweet to your heart's content while the car is driving. But in addition to that, they're gonna be much safer vehicles. And they're gonna be more efficient because you're gonna be able to travel at proximity to other vehicles um, without endangering yourself. And the traffic is going to respond by moving more quickly because cars will be able to stay closer to each other with consistency and with safety. So why am I saying this? Because we don't have enough charging infrastructure and AVs are coming to the markets in 2020 or 2021. Now, some may say that's a problem and freak out, but that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for cities and suburbs and exurban areas to get with the program. We need to start, uh, and that's an, a market opportunity, that's a business opportunity for everyone in this room. You know, go start looking at companies that create and install EV charging systems because you know that the demand for EV charging systems is going to go through the roof over the next five years because we've got a huge, a huge charging gap. And no one demonstrates that gap better than the Ray. With one charging station, we opened an interstate. It's, I mean, that's, you know, that's the kind of impact that you can have. Um, we've also done climate change modeling on the Ray. Um, we're about midway through um, our climate change modeling. The only thing I want y'all to, to realize from this slide is that we need to be doing more 50 year forward modeling of what the weather is likely to be 25, 50, 70 years in the future to understand if our transportation infrastructure is going to be adequate. This isn't one example. Is it going to be underwater? That's a good question. Do we need to build it higher? Or do ask we need Houston. Ask Houston, right. Ask Charleston. Um, ask Puerto Rico. Um, so what our, you know, our little 18 mile exercise of climate modeling has let us know that the state of Georgia has a real concern with temperature. In 50 years, it's gonna be really, really hot here. And it's gonna be hot here on a regular basis. And I'll come back around to that. Um, Costas was telling you all about the tire safety station. Um, a lot of people rolled their eyes, but let me tell you why this is so cool. This is the only tire safety station in the world that's publicly accessible right now. This is the only one in the world that you can use, that you can touch. And here's why it's so cool. This is the only public equipment that will take a look at all of your tires simultaneously and tell you if you need new tires because they're bald. And you may be saying to yourself, well, I can sort of look at my tires and see if they're bald, Allie. But then I would say, hey, when's the last time you looked at your tires? And you would say, I don't remember, right? So this piece of equipment, and it doesn't matter if you're in a school bus or a city bus or an 18-wheeler, or a four-door or a four-tire vehicle. This equipment is agnostic to vehicle type. It will handle your tires. Um, the first piece of equipment that you encounter with the wheelwright, this is a UK company. Um, these are two tire pressure sensor pads that are built into the road. There's 120 pairs of sensors in each of these pads. And those 120 sensor pairs in each pad fires 528 readings per second or so. 
So this is measuring exactly the tire pressure of every tire as the tire rolls over it. And then as soon as your first tires leave the sensor pads, these LED light modules in the middle start strobing light. And they're strobing the undercarriage of your vehicle in order to light up the undercarriage of your vehicle and your tires. Because this is a camera stack. And this camera stack is going to capture hundreds of photos of the surface and the sidewalls of your tires. And from the hundreds and hundreds of photos, it takes seven seconds. Did I mention that? It's kind of like a drive through It's kind of like being at you know, McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, but instead of getting fries, you get a readout of your tire health. And from the hundreds of photos that the system captures, and the thousands of tire pressure readings, it tells you all at the same time, here's the tire pressure of all of your vehicles, and here's your tread remaining. So here's my PSA for the day. Here's the deal with tire tread. When you buy a new car, your tire tread is around eight to 10 millimeters. That's new tires. This system will tell you exactly your tire tread depth between a range of four millimeters, which is when you're about halfway through your set of tires is four millimeters, all the way down to 0.5 millimeters, which is really, really small. Now, legally bald is 1.5 millimeters. So if there's nothing else you remember today, remember 1.5 millimeters is legally bald. This system will measure one half of legally bald and it will tell you run replace your tires. Don't drive, but run and get some new tires. Um, so one thing that you might have noticed is that we do have safety as a main focus, but we're also trying to achieve better outcomes for the environment as well. And this is a perfect example of how technology can give you so many layers of value, right? So this system is gonna tell you when your tires are dangerous because people die because of blowouts. People die because of tire failure. And sometimes you have an accident that's completely unrelated to your tires, but as a part of the accident, you have tire failure and the accident becomes that much more dangerous or fatal. So this system is safety oriented, but while it's working on safety, it's also delivering value for the environment. 2 billion gallons of gas every year, just in the US. I mean, imagine what that must be worldwide. That's billion with a B, just in the US every year because our tires aren't right. That's crazy, right? I mean, and this is, this is foreign oil by and large, right? This is like dangerous, resource and we're wasting two billion gallons because no one's checking out their tires and i get it right i mean we don't have full service station filling stations y'all are so young you don't remember but i remember having people like kicking your tires and cleaning your windshield we don't have that anymore and that's all fine and good we're automated but we have to automate tire maintenance too because people are dying in the country just because their tires aren't right and we're wasting all of this fuel just because our tires aren't right. It's crazy. Okay, so let's talk about energy and I'm just gonna put this out there and then we'll talk about solar and we'll talk about wind for a minute too. But here's what Costas and the Ray and others are working towards. Next time you drive on the highway, I want you to look at all of the area that is just sitting there, right? I want you to look at the shoulder of the highway and think about why nothing's going on there. It just gets mowed and it looks kind of like a golf course, but there's nothing going on there. And for most highways and interstates, it's a lot of land, right? If you stop thinking about linear miles and you start thinking about acreage, it's a lot of land that's just sitting there. And actually, we're spending a lot of money to mow it. 
And then think about, then think about the travel lane. When I'm not on the travel lane at that moment, at that piece of travel lane driving, it just sits there, right? And we've cleared all this land, right? We've spent money to clear the trees and to clear the bushes and to mow the grass. And that means that the travel lane is just totally exposed and baking in the sun. And we're not like doing anything with any of that stuff. It's the last, I'm convinced, it's the last piece in society where we don't expect multitasking. Like my microwave apparently spies on me, but the road does nothing except provide a surface for me to drive on for that one instant. Like what's up with that? I want y'all to start questioning why we don't expect more from our transportation assets because we have a lot of infrastructure. So here's what the Ray thinks. The Ray thinks we ought to put solar on the highway shoulder, like all of it or most of it. And if it's shaded, then let's try wind turbines. And if the wind turbines won't work, then let's farm it. But let's stop mowing it so that it looks like a golf course because it's not a golf course and no one's ever gonna play golf on the side of the road, but we can farm and we can generate clean energy. And while we're at it, if we're gonna generate a bunch of clean energy, does anyone know what form of energy are renewables, wind and solar, what form of energy do they generate? Anyone? <clears throat> okay, it's DC, it's direct current. Our grid today is AC, alternating current. Think about that. So when we generate solar and wind energy, we generate it in DC, and then we have to convert it into AC to go on the grid. That's really inefficient. I mean, we lose a lot of energy that we've generated to take it from DC to AC just so we can put it on our grid. And PS, the grid is like 100 years old. <laughs> it's a relic. So while we're at it, since we're gonna generate a bunch of wind and solar in the right of way, let's throw down some DC grid lines. And we have high voltage super efficient DC grid, it's called high voltage DC or HVDC. We have HVDC grid at our disposal. That technology is here. In fact, the United States government is already planning where HVDC should go. So let's throw it in the right of way, right? It should be on the highway shoulder because if we're gonna generate solar with that wasted land, and if we're going to generate wind energy with that wasted land, then we should have a grid system right there to throw it on. And well, why does that make sense? Because where do interstates go, y'all? They go from your house to your work, right? The interstate connects communities where we live and communities where we work. So like, just think about it for a minute. I don't, have y'all heard of a distributed grid system or microgrids? Right? This is all energy stuff, right? But instead of having a huge coal plant, coal-fired power plant, or a huge nuclear plant in the middle of nowhere, and then driving that energy hundreds of miles on an old inefficient grid to a city like Chicago or Atlanta or wherever, instead of doing that, we should actually have small, small power plants right where people live and right where people work. And if you start moving all of that generation right where it's needed at the demand, that becomes distributed, right? So we think that the highway system is the backbone, is a blueprint for a distributed grid system, right? We should just generate a bunch of clean energy safely on the right of way, throw it on an HVDC grid system on the right of way and send it to where we live and work. Last but not least, we have technology for wireless EV charging. What does that mean? It means there's no wires. It means that your car gets charged without wires from a plate or a coil. And this summer in France, Qualcomm, which is a global company, demonstrated that they could charge a vehicle driving over 60 miles per hour 
at a speed of over 60 miles per hour over the charging plate. That's highway speed, wireless charging in a lane. And if you're generating the clean energy and the highway shoulder, just send it to the, to the EV charging lane. So that's the vision. How do we get there? Costas has already shown you some pictures of Wattway. Um, we have the only one outside of France right now. The only pilot of Wattway outside of France is on the Ray. Um, we competed with Google, Intel, Apple, Arizona State University, and they landed. Um, uh, we're doing solar on the right of way, right? I'm not just talking ideas, I'm talking implementation. And actually, I'm talking about your highway system. I'm going to die before we get to this point where it's totally built out in the future. I'm describing your interstate system. So these are ideas for you to go and figure out how to implement in your corner. Ray Anderson used to say, brighten your corner of the world. Here's what we're doing. In March, not one solar panel, but 3,000. 3,000 solar panels on the highway shoulder that right now, because we haven't started building, but right now that highway shoulder is doing nothing. It's growing some really sad turf grass and it's being mowed every eight weeks. And we're about to turn it into a solar power plant that's really safe that still provides land area for a driver in distress to pull over and find safe harbor. It's a compatible use, according to the Federal Highway Administration. This is totally possible. We should do this everywhere. Solar and wind on the right of way. And ours is going to have pollinator, native pollinator flowering plants as a ground cover so that we can still provide those pollinator meadows. Um, for butterflies and birds, and yes, some of them will be hit by cars, but I'm telling you, the cost-benefit analysis still means that we should plant more habitat for butterflies and bees, right? But this is the cool part, right? Right now, we're trying to create Augusta National Golf Course on the side of the road, but turf grass has three-inch root systems. This doesn't survive on the highway shoulder. Why? Because the highway shoulder ground is disgusting. It's got highway bits and it's got metal and all this crazy stuff in it and it's compacted and it's dry and it's exposed and it's really sad land and turf grass won't survive. But look at this. Six feet root systems and these are natives and they support your food system. One out of every four bites of food that you eat today is provided by a bird, a bee, or a butterfly engaged in pollination. We have to provide their habitat. This is a no-brainer, right? Because this root system is going to prevent erosion on the side of the highway under solar panels. This is a no-brainer. Also, this solar array has a 25 to 35 year maintenance plan guaranteed. You can't plant a pollinator garden anywhere in the U.S. right now and guarantee 35 years of maintenance. No one's backyard has certainty for 35 years, but this solar plant has 35 years of maintenance for a really great pollinator meadow. And it's great. So that's the ray. Um, we've also done um, 10 acres of bioswales with our DOT, and they've agreed to stop mowing. Um, we've done a lot of pollinator meadows, and in fact, all 18 miles are now wildflowers. Um, and in the future, we're looking at solar noise barriers, we're looking at drones, um, we're trying to put together a connected vehicle pilot. Um, in about two weeks, we're going to plant wheat on the shoulder with the Land Institute and our DOT. The Land Institute genetically modified wheat. I know that's scary, but it happened. So the wheat grows itself, it reproduces over winter. And why do we care about wheat on the side of the road? I don't want to eat the loaf of bread made from wheat from the side of the road because that area is disgusting. However, Kimberly Clark makes diapers from wheat. They make highly consumable products. Diapers, toilet tissue, Kleenex, paper towels, the stuff we don't even think about, y'all. How many paper towels and how many squares of toilet tissue have you already thrown away today? 
They make that stuff out of wheat and bamboo now because wheat and bamboo is sustainable. It grows fast and it can go directly into those products and it can break down into landfills um, much easier than the wood that we used, the wood pulp. Um, the other thing about uh, using perennial wheat on the side of the road is that perennial wheat root systems are 12 feet long. That's two of me. That's two of me. And what does that mean? So perennial wheat has so much root systems that we now know that it is one of the superheroes at taking CO2 from the air and absorbing it and putting it into the earth. And that's what we need to be doing, drawing carbon down. So we're gonna plant wheat and we're gonna farm the ray, two weeks. Also sustainable road materials, and this is what I'll end on. I didn't get to the cool slide, Costas, but um, scrap tires make a great road. Scrap tires, when they're added to the binder, which is the sticky, smelly stuff, the black tar in roads. If you add scrap tires, you use less petroleum. So it actually bumps out some petroleum. And what happens is, is that that piece of scrap tire, the binder that you combine it with goes into the piece of tire and it causes it to swell. And it becomes gelatinous, kind of like the jello mold at Thanksgiving. And so remember when I said temperature? Temperature and climate change. Okay, so hot, hot temperatures cause cracking in roads. But when you put rubber from scrap tires in roads, that gelatinous jello mold reduces cracking almost to zero. So you're telling me, actually I'm telling me, <laughs> that I can take scrap tires that build up in dumps and breed mosquitoes and cause Zika, and I can put them into the road and I have a climate change resilient road. Like, yeah, let's do that all day long, right? <laughs> Let's do that all day long, guys. This stuff is so awesome. How many want to work in the road industry now? Come on. Do you think I'm an engineer? No. Do you think I work? And before this, I had no experience in transportation. This is what I'm telling you. Just decide that you're going to devote your life to something that you're passionate about and drive every year of your life towards that goal and towards that mission. My goal and my mission is climate change. I have two four-year-olds. When they're 54, if we don't start changing now, when my two guys are 54, it's gonna be a really messed up world. It really is, because we're gonna have hurricanes and we're gonna have rising sea levels. And I don't wanna paint the nasty picture. I wanna paint the picture of opportunity right now. Figure out what you're gonna to do to change the world and impact the world in your lifetime and drive towards it every day of every year of your life. I am, no pun intended, driving towards a smarter, more resilient, safer, and energy, clean energy producing road. Um, I hope you'll join us because Costas is changing the world and state government, right? Who expected that? Like government? When government shows up, everyone's like, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> But COSIS is changing the world through government, and through government, with corporations, and with philanthropy, we can, um, we got this. We got this. I'm not gonna talk about the cool stuff. We can do that later. Um, but I just wanna show y'all. So Sunday at 9 p.m., watch the Weather Channel, because we're one of the top 10 ways to save the world. Woohoo! Yay! Yeah. years from now maybe you, know, you can come back for another conference here and then we can get a trip to the, uh, to the highway. You don't want to go down there? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the highway because uh, she didn't show you the most exciting part. You thought, you thought that was exciting? Yeah. She left out the most exciting part in my view of the future, of high, future highways. Here's what we did y'all. You know the road reflectors dots not the rumble strips, but the dots that when you drive over them, they go boom. Mm. You know, not the rumble in the jungle is what my kids call it, but the don't. 
So those are dumb, right? They're just like reflector strips. So we made something at the Ray, which remember, Harry and I were just going to plant flowers. But here we are, right? Working with Costas and other partners. So we disassembled it, right? And we made something that's LED lit. Um, and we went ahead and gave it red, green, blue. And it's solar powered with a backup battery. So it'll operate 24 seven. And it has a circuit board and a simple sensor stack. And it makes the road smart. And so instead of these dumb dots with reflector strips, the road now begins to collect information. You know, is it cold and humid? Well, that might mean ice. Is it foggy? Well, I should, I should be brighter, right? Um, it even has a magnetometer, which can tell on either side of a magnetometer if there's a car, how fast it's going. Is it a car or a truck? What's its latitude? What's its longitude? What's its trajectory? And the dots can actually tell if an accident has occurred, right? So, like, what does this mean? Here's, here's the, the idea. Over the next 40 years, we're going to have autonomous vehicles and we're going to have connected vehicles. And probably all of us in the room are going to buy one over the next 40 years. But there are people who are on welfare. There are people who are unemployed. Or there are people who are working two or three jobs and they're making minimum wage or less. Those people are driving a Ford Taurus 20 years from now. And they don't have any information like you do in your connected vehicle, right? They don't have any information like you do in your autonomous vehicle. And that is what we call a mixed fleet. And that scenario that's gonna persist, persist for a couple of decades is gonna be dangerous because you're gonna have people who are very smart and they're smart cars. Well, maybe the people aren't smart, but the cars are smart. <laughs> and they're all gonna be having super data connections that enable super smart driving. But Allie's in her Taurus and she has no idea what's going on. I have zero information. My radio doesn't work anymore, right? I mean, the car's 40 years old. So, so what do we need to do? We need to enable the smart road to glow amber when a mile ahead, the dot realized there was an accident. And the dot that realized there's an accident is mesh networked with all its buddies. And the dot at the accident tells its buddies two mile away, go Amber. And Allie and her Ford Taurus suddenly sees the road go Amber. And I don't know what happened, but I know I need to slow down. Um, we, we're a nonprofit foundation. We own all the IP and we're we're trying to manufacture. But this little node can create the smart road. And so now you see that the road that doesn't do anything for us right now, except provide a driving surface, because of what way it can generate clean energy when you're not shading it right over it. And even when I am over it because of the blip, it can gather important information and tell others to help us achieve a zero death, zero accident highway system. Yes, ma'am. What does that look like in terms of pricing? Yeah, so um, right now we're actually, we have six prototypes and we're trying to make 100 as our next step. So the pricing profile of what this looks like in millions of production is unclear. Um, we have a goal, which is to be no more than $60 per unit and to really be more like $30 per unit. Um, we're a foundation, so we don't need your money, but we need your like, your prayers and your good vibes. <laughs> um, because this is potentially an important part of the smart road network that supports the smart cars in the future. Now, with all this, that attracts a lot more partners into the mix. Right? Companies like Panasonic, companies, uh, uh, federal government agencies like CDC, the Center for Disease Control. How many of you know or knew that CDC also writes the manual about road safety and, and the things that you have need to be in the car and how to protect us and so forth. Well, guess what? Because of what we're doing here collectively, they're also joining the group because they want to know what, what's going to happen in the future. They're going to be testing, you know, they're going to you know, see the tests and so forth, the ideas for them to be able to write the books for safety for, you know, for the next 10, 20 years because what they have now is 20 years old. 
So what I want you to get from all this, from the, these two presentations, is that <clears throat> what you saw in the pictures, you saw the Georgia Department of Transportation, Ray Anderson Foundation, you saw the Department of Economic Development, and many others. Each one of us points to the same pictures to deliver the same, their message. So the Ray Anderson Foundation says this is our mission, sustainability, um, uh, saving lives, energies, saving energy. And they can point to that and say this is how we're accomplishing it. The Department of Transportation, they're all engineers, they haven't woken up yet, but they will soon understand that, hey, look at this. We're not just building bridges and roads to maintain them. We're getting out of our outside our comfort zone, and we're testing new technologies, you know, on our own state-owned assets for the future. Uh, for what to show us what the future highways are going to look like. And me, I can say, hey, look what great state we are to do business. We bring all these people together from around the world, and our mission is energy localizing the energy model, safety, transportation, and so forth. So by all, all of us pointing to the same pictures. And we haven't seen anywhere else that yet. So <clears throat> we're bringing more part, and because of that, more partners are coming in from the federal government and the private industry. Thank Any you. more questions? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if I may, if I may, um, we actually, I had no idea this presentation was going to happen, but um, remember what I said about thinking outside the box, about uh, supporting an environmentally friendly company and potentially joining it? Um, I, I had no idea about any of this, but, but you know, this, this like literally um, is the embodiment of, of that. And... Um, I, I even forgot we've passed lunchtime because this is so great. I, 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 I stopped being hungry. I don't know about everything else. Um, but th this, this was it. And remember that part about Ray Anderson saying, um, you know, I comply. I comply by state and federal uh, regulations and w w whatnot. W what else do you want from me? Um, just to give you two quotes that I had been meaning to give you in my initial speech was uh, one person said, Earth is a spacecraft and we're all passengers on it. Um, BS. Somebody else came up after that and turns around and says, uh, there are no passengers on spacecraft Earth. We're all crew. Um, and that's, that's, I think, what Ray... Uh, kind of came to realize eventually, and he came to realize that you can't just be a passenger and take care of your own stuff. You have to work towards the general functioning of the spacecraft in order to make it uh, better for, for everyone, including, including yourself. Um, I want to talk to them all day long, and I, you know, they're probably going to leave and not going to want to talk to me, um, but we're going to try, I'm going to woo them to stay. <laughs> Uh, with all the food we can throw at them, um, and all the questions we can throw at them, I'll even have Costa be uh, um, a bouncer, and instead of, instead of not allowing people to come in, he's not going to allow them to leave. But um, I do want to say that whoever wants to go for lunch can go for lunch. Um, they will start uncovering things. You can ask questions. You should ask questions. Um, and and also, um, I think Hostess and I both have to go. Hostess has to take his daughter to a lacrosse match. You see, I have a future uh, college student here. Can you stand up a little? She's a future aerospace engineer, but she has a lacrosse game in in an out and out. And she's the goalie of the team. And he, she has to be there. <laughs> so. Uh, that's, the, that's the reason we have to leave. Uh, but I really would like to get, be able to spend more time with you all, spend the entire afternoon. Would you be willing to give your contact information yes, for whoever yes, has absolutely. questions? Okay, great. Yes. And yeah. anyone who wants to email me, I'll send you a free book of Drawdown. That's the new Paul Hawken book. So Paul Hawken, Ecology of Commerce, turned Ray Anderson's life around. 
Um, Paul Hawkins' new book, Drawdown, gives 100 real solutions for reversing climate change. Um, he's worked with scientists around the world to actually run the model to understand why they're the top 100, because he can tell you in gigatons how much CO2 will be drawn or reversed um, because of each. And the top 10 actually includes some, um, some social opportunities that we need to deal with anyway including the education of girls around the world is the number six method of drawing down CO2 and the number seven method, according to the model of drawing down CO2 and reversing climate change is access to family planning. So if you combine six and seven with educated girls who have access to family planning, then you're the number one solution to draw down um, CO2 and reverse climate change. Um, another combination like that is to rely on a more vegetable-based diet and to eliminate food waste. So eating everything on your plate and eating less meat, you don't have to go vegan, but eating less meat, the combination of those, which I think are three and four, create a number one solution to drawing down carbon. That's just a sneak peek into Drawdown. It's an amazing book. It's number seven on the New York Times nonfiction. No, yeah, nonfiction bestseller because it's nonfiction. Um, I'll send you a free one, just email me. Thanks. Oh, did you have a question? I can ask later. Okay. Thank you. Let's get one more round of applause.